morning, Rothfuss. We're going to start with some worship. the Lord to his house.
It's not the Spirit that's worth being perverted. It's nothing. You know, we need the Holy Spirit. So let's call upon His name right now just to praise. Fix our eyes upon the cross. That's the point of us right now. It's just to bring, just to draw closer to the cross of Christ. Recognize our redemption and His love. That's why we're going to sing and praise this morning. <laughs>
praise you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. That's why we're here. Well, welcome. Y'all look great today. How y'all feeling? Are you sure? I mean, we're here to celebrate the wonderful cross we just sang about. So are you serious about that? Or was that just like words that kind of slipped in and out? You know, I am excited. I am so happy that you're here today to worship with us. And we are delighted to have you. And if you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you're our special guests. We thank you so much for being a part of our service and if you are a visitor, we'd like to know a little bit about it. So in the back of your bulletin, this little tear-off sheet, if you tear that off, fill the information out, bring it back to the lobby at the end of the service, they'll, they'll exchange it for a gift. So you bring that back, they'll give you a gift, and, and, and we'll all be happy on that. So if you would take care of that, I'd appreciate it. As we go ahead and move forward in our service, I'd like for you to bow your heads with me in prayer this time. Dear Father, we love you so much. And Lord, I think... Uh, very hard today about the wondrous cross that we are here to celebrate. The, the life that we have to live as a result of, of, of turning ourselves over to you. The wonderful life that we have as a result of the cross. Father, I pray today as we continue to worship and Lord, as we continue to, to listen to your word, Lord, that you would begin to mold and shape and transform our lives into the very image of your son. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would be seated just for a moment at this time, I do want to do something today. Pastor is on vacation, and we have a special guest today, here with us today. I'm going to ask them to come up and, uh, and share a little bit about their, their field. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce you to the newest members of our missionary team that we're sending out. It's the Flores. They're coming, uh, and they're going to uh, Russia. It's Joseph and Darcy Flores. If you guys would give them a hand, please give them a hand. Indianapolis, Indiana, and so, uh, but, you know, through just different circumstances in our life, God um, convicted our heart for, for ministry when we were young, we've kind of been going forward ever since, our city church is out of, um, it's actually Trinity Baptist Church down here in Lufkin, Texas, and so we did our ministry down here, but we're excited to go to the field of, of Russia, and specifically, when you think of Russia, it's a huge nation, with over 10 times over, 145 million people. But we're going to um, the third largest city called Novosibirsk. It's in Siberia, Russia. So it does get cold there about uh, eight months a year. So we're praying for us as we raise some blood for carcass and such. Um, <laughs> our, the name of our ministry is called Why the Snow Outreach. It's based on Isaiah 118. It says, Come now, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We're talking about a country that for over 80 years has dealt under the oppression of communism. Even before then, you had the czars and different, just different dictator, dictatorial systems of government. Not only that, you, you had the crimson states of uh, now that people, uh, uh, modern society where people uh, are, are struggling with addictions of alcoholism, just drug addiction, uh, fornication, all sorts of things that are, that are trapping these people and enslaving these people. And this is a country that really the gospel has never been, um, never really made much inroads. But we are confident, just as Isaiah 118 speaks of, though your sins be as scarlet or crimson, this crimson with deep red stain, we're confident that by the power of the gospel, that they can be as white as snow. And when you think of Siberia, Russia, you think of snow. And there's a reason behind it. But, you know, even though that land might be covered with snow eight, nine months out of a year, the people's heart are deeply stained. And we're confident by going in, starting churches, seeing people saved, seeing lives changed, seeing people come out of these um, the enslavement of addictions and um, alcoholism and all sorts of things, that their lives can be changed so that their souls, their lives can be as white as snow. And we realize as Christians that, and, and especially in America, that the gospel is so readily available. But we're talking about people that really never had the gospel in the country. People that, the only thing they think of uh, Christianity is, is the Orthodox Church. And, and because of communism, you had over 60% of the people just are atheist or agnostic. These people are desperately in need of the, the need for the Word of God. So be praying for us. Visit our table. We have some Russian candy out there. We have our prayer card. 
Be praying for us as we seek to go out to Siberia and capture the city for Jesus Christ, the city of a million and a half people where there's really nothing going on in the city. We want to see the churches started. We want to see lives change. But it's going to take people supporting us to making sure that it can be accomplished. But we're confident, just as our lives as Christians are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that the Russian lives can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we realize that that's the only thing that's going to be able to change a city or a country for God. <coughs> Hey guys, this is Peyton Neal, worship pastor at Central Baptist Church in Tyler. Check us out Sunday mornings at 945 for our small group Bible studies, as well as our 1045 worship service. If you need more information, feel free to visit us at www.centraltyler.org, or if you need more information, just check out the number below. Thank you for watching the video of our service today. We would love to see you here soon.
sing that.
just uh, passed an edict that said if you will follow him on Twitter, that you can lower the time that you have to spend in purgatory. Amen. <laughs> now, that's wonderful, isn't it? So if you get on the line and you'll follow the Pope on Twitter, you can make your stay in purgatory a lot shorter. Now that's what I call the perils of watered-down religion. The Bible speaks of things that have happened in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 read like this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, false accusers, truth breakers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, any, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. We see here a picture of the times in which we live. The times in which uh, John the Revelator wrote when he wrote the book of Revelation, chapters 2, 3, and 4. We read about several churches there. And one in particular we read about in the age of the Laodicean period of time. Many scholars say that these seven churches represent seven periods of the church history. And I think you can use it that way. In fact, that's the way I'm using it today. Laodicea age being the last age of the church before the return and the soon rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. First point today I want to bring to your attention is this. You can't have your own Bible. You can't edit God. And I think this is a problem with a lot of folks today. They want to have their own Bible. They want to edit God. They want to have a God that fits their standards. They want to have a God that fits their lifestyle. Today a lot of people are living in a watered down version of Christianity. What concerns me is many of these people who are running around and saying they're Christians do not have lifestyles that back up that promise. I'm a Christian, yes, but my lifestyle doesn't back it up. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 3, and we were talking about the lay of the sin age while ago in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I know thy works. Thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that thou were hot or cold. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Every once in a while I get real generous and I decide to take Phyllis out for a good meal. So the other night I wanted to treat her like a king. So we went to Burger King for a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> and we got there and we ordered a hamburger and fries and drink. And when they got there, started to eat them, Phyllis said, these fries are old. I said, well, that's okay. We can make it one time. Said, no, I paid for warm hot fries. These are wilted, they're greasy, they're old. I said, let's don't make a scene. She said, I'm not going to eat them. I want fries that are hot. So we got fries that were hot. And you know what? I'll have to agree with them. They're a whole lot better than those wilted, greasy fries that they had brought for us the very first time. What I'm trying to tell you is this who wants a lukewarm fry? I want one that's hot, one that's fresh, one that is good. <clears throat> so the second thing we learn from this scripture is that God wants the real thing. In the same way, God doesn't want our lukewarm, half-baked, wannabe Christianity. He wants the real thing from us. That's what He expects from us. He has some standards. He has some rules. He has some guidelines for we who are believers in Christ. And He expects us to live, obey, and go by His rules. As I mentioned to you a while ago, we can't write our own Bible. We can't edit God. It would make more sense to me, I would think, when I read this scripture in, in Revelation chapter 3, that when He said, I would that you were hot 
are cold, but not lukewarm. That puzzled me for a long time. I thought, well, if I were writing it, I said, I wish you were, were hot. But if you can't be hot, at least be lukewarm. But for goodness sake, don't be cold. Wouldn't that make more sense? It did to me for a long time until I finally understood what he's trying to tell us. He said, I want you to be hot for me. I want you to be engaged in, in my work. I want you to be the person that, I, that you should be following by the principles and the rules which I have laid down in my word. You read them, you understand them, you live by them. Well, that would make sense. But then when he said, if you can't be hot, I at least hope, I hope you're cold. I'd rather you be cold. If you can't be hot, I'd rather you be cold. And I thought, okay, now what is he trying to say here? I think he's trying to tell us that I wish you were, if you can't be hot, at least if you're cold, that sooner or later you'll come to your senses and realize something's wrong. Now, when he was writing to these people here, he was writing to, to a group of people in Laodicea who knew what it meant to drink warm water. Now, I want you to know, I don't like warm water. How many of you like lukewarm coffee? Nobody drinks lukewarm coffee. Oh, well, I, said, I should have said no one or so, too. Uh, everybody wants it hot. They want hot coffee. If it's not hot, they won't drink it. I don't drink coffee. I don't drink anything hot. So that doesn't bother me. But I like the stuff cold. I don't like it lukewarm. I like it cold. If I'm going to have iced tea, I want a half a glass of ice and a half a glass of tea. So it's good and cold. So I begin to understand. I think I see what God is talking about here. But they, in Laodicea, they brought in their water from about six miles away. They brought it in from some cold springs. And as they would bring in that water, by the time it traveled that six miles and got to them, it was lukewarm. So he was taking something they all understood, lukewarm water, and he's saying, I don't want you to be that way. Nobody likes that. They want it to be hot or they want it to be cold. Because if you're cold, at least you stand a chance of making a change. So that's what he's talking about. At least someone who is cold and spiritually dead may one day come to senses and recognize that he has a need for God. We can come to church and say, I love God. We can come to church and say, isn't God wonderful? Isn't He good? We can sing the songs. We can fellowship with one another, and then we can leave from here, and that's the last of our Christianity until next Sunday. I hope that's not the case with you, is it? Because we come to church for a particular reason. We come here, number one, to hear the Word of God preached. We come here, secondly, to learn how that we can live for Christ during the week. We come so that we can learn what the principles of God are for our life and how we can live. He said, I want you to have the mind that Christ had. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. And so that's what we're trying to do to come to church in a Bible study, to Wednesday night, to pray, to get the mind of Christ, to learn what Christ would have us to do. The third thing that we see is God created us to worship Him. He made us to glorify Him. But here's the key to it. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. You can worship God in wrong way. You can worship Him the right way. Don't you think it would be best to worship God in the right way? Amen. In John's Gospel, we find an overview given by Jesus on the purpose and the objective of worship. He converses with a woman at the well. We know it as the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. So the woman has been married and divorced five times and she's living with a man who is not her husband at this very moment. you got to give her credit. She keeps trying. <laughs> and she's hoping that she's going to find Prince Charming, someone that will fulfill her life. The only trouble is she's looking in all the wrong places. I learned, if you'll wait, God will send you one. And I got a good one. And she's been a great help me for 62 years. So I'm thankful that I waited till God gave me the one that He wanted me to have. Don't rush into something just because you think you're going to live the rest of your life as a single person. God's got somebody for you. Just wait. 
I know it's hard. We'll give it a try. In John chapter 4, notice how that she diverts the Lord Jesus from what he is trying to tell her. He is trying to tell her, to look, I have water that you can drink that you'll never thirst again. And she said, oh boy, that's good. I'd like to have that kind of water. I wouldn't have to come down here every day in the heat of the sun to draw water. You see, because of the person she was, she could not come at the early morning in the late afternoon because she would not be welcome. But she could come in the heat of the day and get her water, so she was all ears. But notice what she says. I'm going to read in verse 19 of chapter, John chapter 4. The woman, said, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain. She's speaking about Gerizim. And ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship your father. You worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is. When the true worshiper shall worship the Father, notice not carefully, in spirit and in truth. There's two elements to worship, spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. So what is He trying to tell her? He's telling her that something's going to happen. There's going to be a new era. You say you're worshiping going over here in Mount Gerizim. That's where the pagans were worshiping. He said that won't cut it. That's not proper worship. That's not true. I will not accept that. And he said that on the other hand, we have the Jews who are worshiping, worshiping here in Jerusalem. And boy, do they go by the rules of the law. I mean, they have so many rules, they hardly know how to worship. He said, that's just as bad. You're looking at a legalistic way to serve and worship God. That won't work either. So you can't worship Him the way the world does or the Mount Garrison crowd. That's not going to work. God says, I will not accept it. And He says, on the other hand, if you've got this legalistic uh, type of uh, religion where you've got to jot every I and cross every T and you can't uh, even move without making some kind of a wrong or right decision, that's not going to work. He said, I'm telling you, there's coming a time when all of that's going to change. It has. Big time. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment. But I just want you to see right now that he is setting up for what he is going to do at a later time in the Gospel of John. The Jews had the right object, but theirs was all external. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians, you're more external than you are internal. Because when you have something on the inside, it's going to come out. When it's on the inside of you, it's going to change you. You don't have to have a set of rules to gauge uh, uh, how you should live. It's automatic because God is impressing you through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that you received when you accepted Him. And that Holy Spirit is living within me. He guides me. He directs me. He lets me know when I'm doing something wrong. You know, people say, well, I just didn't know that was wrong. Yeah, you do. What's happened over a period of time, you've done something so wrong so long, you think that is now the norm. But the first time you did that thing that you knew was wrong, it bothered you. And then you did it again. It didn't bother you quite as much. Then you did it again and it bothered you even less. Until now you can do it to where the Bible says you don't even know whether it's safe or lost. Your conscience can be seared. You have to be careful. Somebody said, well, I knew that. No, it doesn't bother my conscience. You better check up. It, it, it may be seared. When my wife cooks a roast, she sears it. You know what she does? She turns on the oven, on the, the, uh, on the uh, burner up on top of the oven. She has the oven up to where she's going to cook. But she puts it in the pan up there. And man, I'm telling you that thing. Boy, just sizzles and sparkles. And she burns that. I said, well, man, I don't want to burn roast. She said, this is just the first step. So she sears it. 
And she locks in all the flavor. Then she takes it out of, off of the top of the stove and puts it in the pan and puts it in the oven. And then it cooks through and through and through. And all of that good stuff doesn't come out. It stays in the room. And man, when I sit down to eat, it is good. It's worth it. And that's what's happened. You can sear your mind to where that you don't know what is right and wrong. So even though the Jews had the right method, they did it in a wrong manner. In the same way, people today will pick and choose things from the Bible they like. And what they don't like, they reject it. They said, oh, well, don't worry about that part. Hey, it's all truth. Amen. If any part of it's not truth, it all falls apart to begin with. Amen. So you've got to have the whole counsel of God. You can't take one part. You can't take another part. It's got to all be, hey, I'll be honest with you. There's some parts in here I don't like. It hurts to read them. It hurts to, to study them. It bothers me. You know why? I'm not living according to the way that God has put it out. And so when I don't, don't live that way, it bothers me. That's what the Word is supposed to do. That's why it will cleanse us by the washing of the Word. The more you read, the cleaner you get. Amen. That's why God said, listen... I have something against you. Why? You've left your first love. Let me tell you a story. 1924. Professor Ueno at the Japanese university picked up a little Akita dog, a little white Akita dog. Took it home with him. He took that little dog home. And as he took him home, he began to train him. Began to work with him. A little white Akita. They're a very loyal dog. So he got this dog in 1924. For a year. As he would go down to the station there. In Shibuya. And he would get on board the train. The little dog learned his, his pattern. And when he'd hear that train coming. The Chico. The little dog. Would run to the station to meet his master. He did that every day for a year. One day, the Chico went to the train station. He went to the train, train station. The train pulled in. He waited, and he waited, and he waited. Dr. Nuino never showed up. He didn't know what to do. So he just stayed there. The Chico didn't understand that that morning at the university, Dr. Ueno had had a massive stroke and died in his classroom. So the Chico was just doing what he always did. He went to meet his master. His master never showed up. So what are you going to do? You got a dog in your hands. They gave him to some of the relatives, but he didn't. Wanted no part of that. He escaped from them, ran back to where he knew. So that some of the folks begin to see the Chico sitting out here at this one little spot every evening. Every evening when that train came in, it was a Chico sitting at his spot. Weeks pass. Months pass. Years pass. For nearly 10 years, in May the 21st, 1935, 10 years later, the Chico died. But for 10 long years, he went to that train station faithfully. Some of the people then began to feel sorry for him. They began to feed him. They fed the dog. He would get into fights, have scrapes. He would sleep on at the railroad station underneath one of, one of the cars that was the railway cars that was parked there. But for 10 years, he went to that station faithfully every evening when the train came in. No master. You said, what does that story have to do with what you're talking about? All right, let me make the application for you. In John chapter 14, Jesus gathers his 12 
bend the cycles around. He begins to instruct them. For the first time, he has now revealed to them that he is going to be crucified. They're concerned. They don't understand. So he wants to comfort them. So he, in John chapter 14, verse 1, he tells them this. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, how can we know the way? How can we know where you go? And then he quoted this in verse 6. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he is preparing them for what's going to happen. Move on over five chapters in John chapter 19. And you'll see that Jesus Christ is arrested. They come and they hold a trial for him, which was unlawful the way they did it. But they held a trial. They accused him. And they said, let's crucify him. And they crucified the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine the devastation of those 12 people? They have given up everything they've had. They left all, as they had said. And we have followed you. What would you do if the master you had put all of your faith in is now dead and in the grave? But I got news for you. Three days later, something exciting happened. Jesus came out of that grave alive, bodily. And he walked and he talked for 50 days with these men to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to teach them further. One day he took them out, said, let's go out to the Mount of Olives. So he took them out to the Mount of Olives. And as he got out to the Mount of Olives, he said, okay, guys, I need to tell you something now. And in Acts chapter 1, here's what we find. And he tells us what to do. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. And as he was delivering that message, the next verse tells us, and he began to ascend into heaven. And as he began to ascend into heaven, they watched him as he went. And all of a sudden, a couple of angels in what apparel. And they stood and they looked at him and looked down at these disciples and said, why are you standing here? This same Jesus. Notice these three words. This same Jesus. Never forget that. Let it ring in your heart. Let it ring in your mind. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's telling us, I'm coming back for you again. This same Jesus, not another, not someone else, but the same Jesus Christ that was crucified on Calvary's cross, rose bodily from the dead, and now he's coming back. And he said, I'm coming back for you. Remember John 14? In my father's house, what is he doing? He's preparing our mansions for us. This is a very special month for me, July. It was July 64 years ago at Central Baptist Church down at the old facility in Lava. I old facility down on Beckham Street. But I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. As a 16-year-old guy, I accepted Christ. And for 64 years, every morning, when I get up, I said, Lord, is this the day? You promised me you're coming back for me. Is this the day? And it may not be today. I may not live to see him come in my lifetime. I sort of have a hankering that I will. Because the things that are happening now could be very simple. 
But you know what? I'm like little Pacheco. It makes me no difference. If he doesn't come back, I'm all right with that. For 2,000 years, preachers have been preaching. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. And you say, and the critics say, he hasn't come back yet. And you still believe that garbage? Yeah, I do. I have the promises of God. I have His word that He's coming by. Paul, I think, put it best. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on in corruption. And this mortal was put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You say Born again, I'm telling you, it's worth it to be a believer in Christ. Don't worry what anyone else says. It's still real. God's coming back. That's His promise. You believe it? In this crowd today, three groups of people are sitting in this audience. One of them is a group of people who love the Lord have been born again, love the Lord, and they're serving Him to the best of their ability, honestly, and to the best scriptural way that they can serve Him. Let me give you that verse 58 that I did not quote. Be ye steadfast, always unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I don't care what you do for Him, it's worth it. Uh, you can't outwork Him. You can't outgive Him. Be faithful. Hang in there. There's tough years. There's tough times. Things happen. I understand that. But God is faithful. Be steadfast. Unmovable. Don't let anything deter you from serving God. Serving the Master. He may not be coming back on the train. You may go to the train station ever so often he's not there, but he's promised he's coming back. The second group, those that are saved, but you may not be living for the Lord, and you know it. You know there's things in your life that are not pleasing to him. You know that what you're doing, God does not approve of. You know that your lifestyle is not applicable for a believer in Christ. If so, you need to get it right today. Because the Bible tells us again that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive in our body the deeds that we have done, whether they be good or bad. So that tells me that there's good deeds and bad deeds. We have the choice of what we do. What you need to understand today, every choice, every decision that you make has a consequence with it. You will not make a decision in life that doesn't have a consequence with it, either good or bad. Every decision you make has a consequence. Just remember that. Some for bad and some for good. Then there's a third class of people that's in this audience today. Let me direct my attention to you for just a couple of minutes. You have never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. You don't know what it is to have the joy and the peace of Christ living within you. You have no idea. You've never at some point in your life knelt and said, Lord, forgive me of my sin debt and forgive that sin debt because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? Dead. So somebody's got to pay that price. Why should you pay it? You said, I didn't know I had a choice. You do. The choice is this. Jesus Christ has already died for you. He's already paid that sin debt. What a tragedy. 
What if someone were to call me up on the phone and say, hey, Bill, I just bought you a new Cadillac down at Cadillac did it, go down and pick it up. I said, oh, I don't know. That guy pulling my leg. I guarantee if you call me, I'll go check it out. <laughs> you, you say, how, do, how can I believe him? I know who Jesus Christ is. I know who God is. He cannot lie. So he says that if thou shalt confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is a promise. He goes on down in verse 13 and reiterates it again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I always like to tell somebody, put your name in. The night I trusted Christ is my Savior. I read that verse of Scripture. My mom kneeling beside me. She said, read it this way, son. That if Bill will accept Jesus Christ, as his personal Savior, he shall be saved. I read it that way that night, and it changed my life forever. 64 years ago <coughs> this month, when my life was dramatically changed, I've never been the same since. I invite you, if you're here today and you're lost, you've never been saved, why not come and do it today? Let's stand together, shall we? Hi, my name's Kim Beckham. I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.